Okay, I'm Nancy Foner. I'm Bill Labashi Triber. I'm chairing the committee. Phil Kassinitz. Charles Green. Edmund Tavernier, the dad. <coughs> Keon Luga, the brother. Francis Joseph. Candace Arthur, close friend. Uh, <laughs> and I'm Latoya. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here today. Very happy that this moment has come. And I am not going to waste any time with anything else, so we're just going to jump right into this presentation. So, uh, my project is called uh, On the Midnight Train to Georgia, Afro-Caribbeans, and the New Great Migration to Atlanta. And, just, no idea how this works on this computer. That's better. All right, starting off with my research questions, uh, there was two things that I really wanted to find out when I started this project, it was pretty much what factors have contributed to the emergence of Atlanta as a new destination for Afro-Caribbean immigrants. Pretty much, why are they going there? What is going on? What is it about this city that all of a sudden people want to uh, move here? Uh, and the second question was about how Atlanta's large African-American and growing immigrant populations have shaped the incorporation of Afro-Caribbeans into uh, the southern city. And um, this was just me trying to pretty much understand how are they fitting in? Uh, are they creating communities? Are they just blending in and not really doing anything? Like, can you tell their presence is there? Are they having, um, are they, are, is their experience going well in this city? And to do this, I used three different methods. So uh, at first, I did 33 in-depth interviews with Afro-Caribbean migrants in Atlanta. This included births for, of them both first generation, which means uh, they were Caribbean born, and uh, second generation, which means they were of Caribbean parentage. Um, I also followed that with a participant observation at almost every Caribbean event and space that I could get myself to um, in the metro area, starting off with their annual Atlanta Caribbean Carnival, which I thought was a great way to start because, I mean, this is probably the, the biggest thing you could, you could find to show you that, um, that there are Caribbean people in the area. Um, and then for the last part, I looked at uh, U.S. Census data from 1990 to 2010. I started with 1990 because that was really the time when the uh, surge of migration began, so I thought it'd be a great place to start to understand uh, how has the community changed? Has it gotten larger? What does it look like? How, how old are the people? Is it male? Is it female? What jobs do they have? So uh, this was just there to kind of fill in some of the holes since I am looking at a smaller group of people. So, what I found, who are these Afro-Caribbeans in Atlanta? Um, most, for the most part, even from my study and from the census data, I found that most of the migrants down there are pretty much in their mid-30s, so it's not an older generation, it's not a retirement, uh, large retirement group. These are people that are still uh, young and working. I also found that it's more than 50% women, um, not too much, but uh, it seems like women are kind of um, leading this migration, and also that they're college educated, they're mostly professionals, uh, they're mostly middle class, and um, the most important thing that I think that most people ask me when I talk about my, my subject is where they had a lot of people in my own study and even looking at the census data that people were coming from New York City. And the main thing to remember about this also is that they've spent a large amount of time um, in these uh, other places. So they spent a large amount, at least a decade in New York before they even moved um, to Atlanta. So they weren't fresh off the boat, as people say. They were very much established. They understood the lay of the land um, and already established themselves, and then they moved. Uh, the second group that I found was coming from the South, which was surprising to me because I really didn't think, um, especially as a northerner, that anyone would be moving from uh, someplace like Florida to Atlanta. To me, it was like the same thing, like if you're going from the South to the South. Uh, but I found that uh, the second largest group was coming from different southern states, so Florida, uh, coming from uh, North Carolina, uh, Texas, Louisiana, I heard all these different things, but for these same people, they usually lived, uh, again, somewhere else, another traditional destination, so they lived in New York or Boston, or they lived in Toronto before they moved to this southern place and then moved to Atlanta. Okay, why are they moving? There are several things that I found about why they were moving. Um, the first one was based off of social networks, so they're actually being recruited 
by people, uh, either their friends or their families. So I'm thinking, you know, Caribbean networks. My mother and my sister and my brother moved down there. Uh, they said it was great, so I we decided to come down there too, and they helped me, you know, find um, housing. Another one that I found um, that doesn't really get talked about as much when we talk about immigrant networks is a race-based network. So uh, they were actually also using um, traditional black institutions like uh, black letter, um, black Greek letter organizations, so sororities and fraternities, AKAs, uh, alphas, they were these institutions that came out of historically black colleges, they were using these networks also um, to move down to Atlanta. So even if they didn't know someone, having a chapter down there helped them because they can go, oh, my fraternity brother at this chapter in Atlanta helped me do this because we already have a connection as being a part of the same organization. So they didn't even have to know each other. Um, and you wouldn't be surprised, they also came down there for, uh, for jobs. People said they came down there for homes, especially those who came from the Northeast who, um, you know, they, they understood that you can get more house for their bucks. So they can get bigger houses um, in Atlanta as opposed to what they could get in the Northeast. And another thing is that they were talking about quality of life, so saying things like the weather was better, the, the atmosphere was more relaxed, and people just seemed friendlier and happier uh, living in the South um, than in living in the, the bustling northern cities. Another major factor uh, that came up um, that really surprised me was this idea of what uh, their blackness or their race played in this, this part. And as I call it here, um, it was the idea of blackness as a plus. So they saw Atlanta as this black city and they were very much attracted by the large black professional and middle class. They liked the image that it had as this place of black power and history and culture. Um, you know, the, the mayors have been black since the 1970s. They really liked that and the image of black success that you could see very easily as opposed to um, some cities in the, north, in the northeast where they came from where it'd be a lot harder to see unless you go into certain companies and businesses to see it. But there, they were like, you can see it on the street um, that black people are doing well there. Also, they got a sense of like racial comfort, as I like to call, from the fact that when they went down there, there was other people that looked just like them. And it wasn't like they moved someplace and then they felt unfamiliar, they stuck out with a sore thumb. It was the idea that, okay, you're black, I'm black, and it's nice to be able to not be that um, foreign in this area. So these were some of the things that um, they brought up. And they brought that up more than they did saying, you know, I like that it has a growing Caribbean um, community. And that really rarely happened. They would say it was a bonus that I can still talk, see other Caribbean people and eat Caribbean foods and go to Caribbean parties, but the main reason I came down here is because I wanted to be a part of this black um, success movement. Uh, so, uh. All right, so talking about how are they blending in, how are they being incorporated? Uh, one of the first things that I found out when I was talking to people is that there actually is like a Caribbean uh, neighborhood in Atlanta that's formed. Uh, it's been pretty much established since the, the migration started in the 1990s. Uh, and it's something that if you were thinking of um, equivalents, you can think of Crown Heights or Flatbush area in New York, like places that um, people know, if I want to get Caribbean food or Caribbean products, where do I go? Um, and this is exactly where they tell you. And even for me, when I first arrived in Atlanta to start my study, I ended up in Stowe Mountain without even asking. Like a friend just brought me there and said, this is where you know, the Caribbean party is and this is where we're going. So um, I found that it was very, uh, it was a very interesting area, mostly for the fact that I knew that it had a history of being the center for the Ku Klux Klan down there, but it didn't seem to come up in conversation when people were talking about, oh, you have to go to Stone Mountain, you have to go to Memorial Drive in Stone Mountain uh, to get your food and your, and your products and stuff. Um, also, another thing that I really was interested in is looking at the Atlanta Caribbean Carnival, and it was a lot bigger than I actually thought it would be. I still thought of Atlanta as this small Caribbean community, especially since I had been there several times and had no idea that there were Caribbean people there. But um, their carnival has been well established. It started in the, 19, uh, the late 1980s uh, when their population was still pretty small. Around that time, it was probably about 5,000 to 8,000 people there. But somehow they got the support to uh, put on this festival and show like, you know, we live here and we want to celebrate our culture and be a part of, you know, Atlanta's history. And this happens right in downtown Atlanta, so it's not happening in some neighborhood on the side. This is happening down the streets of, of, of Atlanta, where if you're going down there on Memorial Day weekend on the Saturday, you'd have to divert yourself. You would see the colors and then hear the music and, and know that it's happening. So 
Um, another thing that really really came about was talking about some of the relations they have with the uh, African American community. And the one thing I was concerned about is knowing that the South had such a pushback uh, towards immigrants coming into the area. There was a very huge, like if you're looking at the news, most of the anti-immigrant sentiments and policies were coming out of some of these states where they were, they were trying to arrest people for um, trying to get licenses, they were trying to make sure that they couldn't go to public schools, um, and it's not like they didn't have the same policies in Georgia either. They had an English only, um, uh, well, English is the official language uh, um, thing, uh, pro policy that they were trying to push through, and there were also um, definitely, there was one where they had the four, I think the five major uh, public colleges, they were trying to make sure that you had uh, documentation before you can even register. So even if you're paying for it yourself as a state school, they still wanted to see like you are an American citizen uh, to be able to do that. But for, uh, I feel like for Afro-Caribbeans, because they look so much like the larger black community that they kind of had a buffer between them and some of uh, the anti-immigrant sentiments that were definitely brewing in the area because people were talking about, um, you know, immigrants coming in and, you know, they're, they're trying to take jobs and they're on the streets and they're doing this. But I think, um, unfortunately, because there's also a large Latino immigrant community that they took the brunt of it and then they're able to also hide behind, you know, we're black, we look black and um, we're not different from everyone here. Well, on the last part, <clears throat> Uh, there was a few things that I found about the kind of communities and connections that were, they were forming. And um, the interesting part is that because so many of them are step migrants and coming from other U.S. cities, that they're actually creating connections between Atlanta and these, area, and these other areas that they left behind, especially New York. Um, several of them that were New Yorkers were telling me so much about how they go back every year. They fly back to New York like four or five times a year because, I mean, the flights aren't that expensive. They're like $200 on AirTran or Delta. You can get there in two hours. Uh, and they had no problem doing that to go get any music or food or products that they couldn't get um, easily or cheaply in uh, Atlanta, and also just to attend family functions. They still mentioned that New York was still home. They still consider themselves New Yorkers in Atlanta. I don't think anyone called themselves an Atlantan or whatever people call themselves in Atlanta, but um, they all still consider themselves New Yorkers and was still going back for family functions and staying connected. And at the same time, what I found also was that a lot of New Yorkers in Atlanta were still hanging out with the same people they hung out with when they were in Atlanta. So, I mean, when they were in New York. So, it's like they have all their close friends are all former New Yorkers too. Like, yeah, you know, I knew this person lived down the block from me, this person went to school with me, and I came down, and they came down 10 years later, and we all found each other, and we pretty much just only associate with um, other Caribbean New Yorkers. So, that was an interesting aspect that I found from that. And uh, for future research, um, I'd really be interested to see, uh, just coming off of my own work, uh, what African Americans' responses are to black immigrants. So that includes uh, you know, Afro-Caribbeans, African immigrants, uh, Afro-Latinos, anyone that is a little bit uh, different for the area, but are definitely coming in here. What are their responses? And I think the research that's going on now is looking at uh, their responses to like, Latino immigrants coming in, especially in the rural areas where they're kind of um, both fighting for the same jobs and positions, but it'd be interesting to see what they feel about these, you know, these other black people that are here. Um, I also want to understand the experiences of uh, African and Afro-Latino immigrants in Atlanta. Uh, as I said before, there's a large population um, of just Latino immigrants, and that also includes black Latinos, which people don't talk about as much, but they're very much a part of the, um, the conversation. And also the African population is uh, African immigrant population is about the same size as the Afro-Caribbean one. So they're at par, they're both professionals, they're both middle class, and it'd be interesting to see um, what their experiences are if it's similar to Afro-Caribbeans, especially since they have um, a language uh, barrier that they have to also overcome. And the last part is just trying to understand the roles, I'd love to see more research on understanding the roles of black institutions, so the church, um, some of the schools that are there. I mean, these are the pillars of these communities that helped them through the Civil Rights Movement and past that, and, and pretty much was what helped Atlanta get to, you know, owning the mayorship and the, the local government. Like, how, how are they playing a part in the migration experience of black immigrants? And this is the end. Um, <laughs> I want to thank everyone. I want to thank my chair, Vilna, and my community members, Nancy, Phil, and Charles. And a special thanks to my friends and family that trekked up here and listened to me talk about my work. So uh, I'm now 
open for your questions. Let's go. <laughs> so, would you prefer?